Okay, in the co-main event, we had Derek Lewis versus Francis Ngannou. I gave you my thoughts on that fight. Now let's check in with Derek Lewis, see how he's doing. There he is, the one and only Black Beast himself. Derek, how are you? I'm okay. What's up? Where are you at? Best Buy. Best Buy? Yeah. In Houston? Yeah. What are you getting? No, in Canada. <laughs> Where are you? <laughs> you know Toys R Us closed in America, but it's still open in Canada. Did you know that? Yeah, you told me that. Um, the other day. <laughs> Wait, That's are cool. you are you sitting in one of those like makeshift li living rooms? Yeah. Just. Ch <laughs> this is amazing. What are you getting? <laughs> Look at them TVs, man. Oh yeah, with that bonus that you got, that win bonus. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah, the wind bone. Nah, that's going straight to the bank. I ain't touching that. Okay. You meant, yeah, right, because, like, you, you thought I meant, like, a performance bonus. Yeah. Hell no. Derek, how's your back? It's hurting right now. Like, when it's you say... real stiff. When you say hurt, like, could you explain what you're feeling? It's like, um, I'm working it out. Like, I worked it out too much. And then how does that... Like, I'm doing day lift or something right. like that. How That's does how does that compare to Saturday though? Saturday morning when you or when did you start to feel like this could be a problem? Um, Saturday morning actually. Yeah, we um try to crack my back, stretching and all that, and just the pain just didn't want to go away. It wasn't as bad until fight time, though. How did it feel around fight time? Um, whenever I got in the cage, everything was good, but once I start moving around and stuff like that, then it got worse. Wow. And what, what does that feel like? Like you said it was on fire after the fact. Is that what it feels like? I think you're yeah, taking, it was you're taking another fire. call here or something? What's going on? Yeah, there you are. You're back. Yeah, Malky was calling me. Malky? Jeez. Yeah, I don't know. Um, are you freaking out when this happens? Are you freaking out? Like, no, please not now. <laughs> Oh, yeah, for sure, because I've been through that situation twice already in my career. Uh, once with Mark Hunt and um, again against a guy named Ryan um, Cleveland, uh, Rakeem Cleveland, and back in 2011. Okay, so we recall what happened against Verdum, right? You had to pull out the day of. Was it close? Did you think you might have to pull out? Was it that bad? No, it wasn't that bad at first. Okay. But when, once we got off the bus at the stadium, then it was, really. You know, but I, I didn't want to pull out for nothing because I really wanted to knock this guy out. And you know, it, it was already too late. Right. After that. Um, when, when, when you're feeling that way, that close to the fight, you can't get those shots, right? It's too late for USADA? Um, they tried to give me the shots last time with the Fabrizio fight, but... um. My manager told me not, that wouldn't be a good idea because it would thin my blood. And if I get cut, I would bleed. Like, I would bleed a lot. Okay. So when the fight's happening early on and he's just not throwing anything, what's going through your mind? I'm like, okay, he must be trying to wait for me to come in and try to counter or something. You know, and I don't know. It was just a weird situation, period. What's that? They're making you move there? You can hear me? Yeah, I hear you. I said it was just a weird situation, man. What are you thinking? What's wrong with this guy? Yeah, I was thinking like it was part, I guess it's part of his game plan or something like that. But, I, you know, I wanted to do more and I wish I would have did more, you know, even though I, how much pain I was in, but I still wanted to put on a better performance than I did. You know, I really blame myself, really. It's really not too much on his part. It's really my part. Why do you blame yourself more? I mean, he came out. Did you see the statement that he just put out? Nah. He, he put out a statement uh, saying that he, he, he was afraid from his last fight, like like the, the lingering effects of the last fight affected him, and he was, he was still thinking about it, afraid to pull the trigger and things like that, and apologize for his performance. Does that make it... Does that does that make a little more sense as to why he fought that way after hearing that? No, not at all. I believe it was my fault. Why? I believe I should have pushed the pace a little more, you know, because I'm the one that called them out and and I wanted this fight and I wanted to really put on um, put on a show, you know, especially being my first pay per view um, appearance. When you're when you're looking at him. 
Does he look scared to you? Like, do you see a guy who's timid? Whenever he first got in the cage, he looked completely different. I didn't even know if that's the same guy or not. You know, I even told my coaches that. I was like, man, this dude don't even look the same. His face, his expression, or nothing don't even look the same. Wow. What did you see? Oh, I, I've seen that he was scared. I wow. noticed he was scared in his face and he looked scared. Does that kind of blow your mind that someone that strong and big could be scared? No, I'm, I've seen it before. You know, I've seen it in um, Gabriel Gonzaga face as well. Wow. So in your mind, you see that, you recognize that, you say, okay, there's an opening here, but you just can't pull the trigger yourself because you're in so much pain? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. You know, I just thank God that I lasted long enough um, that I did. Because if it was a five-round fight, ain't no way in the world I could have lasted that long. Do you think you went pretty much as far as you could go, 15 minutes? Yeah. Wow. Did you think you had done enough to win the fight, though? I had, I know for sure I had to do enough to win the fight at the last few seconds. You know, I had to do something. Here's the part that you know, impresses I, I me. I really want to apologize to my fans, you know, for the type of performance like that. Uh, trust me, I, that was not the game plan at all. How did you throw leg kick? Not, not even leg kicks. You were throwing like body kicks, head kicks with your back, with your back like that. How is that even possible? Yeah, I could throw the leg. Leg kicks, I could throw all day, but whenever I throw my right hand, I cannot throw it without any pain. Wow. Okay. So, so the kicks actually feel better. The kicks feel better, but I can't throw right hands, and that's one of the reasons I was throwing a lot of leg kicks against um, Mark Hunt because I could throw leg kicks, but I couldn't throw my right hand. What was the game plan? You said that wasn't the game plan. What was the game plan? My coach really wanted me to take him down. I'm like, come on, coach. <laughs> I'm like, come on, man. You know, I don't, I didn't want to take him down, but that was the game plan to take him down, you know, and pound him out. But, you know, the opportunity wasn't ever there. Did you even practice your wrestling? Away every time I got close to him. Did you practice your wrestling? Yeah, we practiced wrestling the whole camp. But there was no opportunities. And also yeah, there was no opportunity. You know, I'm still working on um, like shooting and all that. And coming in and trying to get the takedown, I'm still working on that. Did you notice the crowd doing the wave and, and opening their cell lights and things like that in the middle of the fight? Of course I did. Oh. Uh, that was cool, though. <laughs> <laughs> it was almost like a surround sound. <laughs> you, you weren't offended? No, not at all. I don't blame them. You know, I understand it was a boring fight. Of course, I was so bored that I even noticed it. I noticed it. <laughs> you were bored in your own fight. Has that ever happened to you? What's that? Have you ever been bored in your own fight before? Have I ever what? Been bored in your own fight. Yeah, I was real bored. I was bored for real. <laughs> you you, you told know, I wanted I was I wanted to do more though. You know, I I tried. But every time I come forward, that he like back away and move up, move away and stuff like that. Or I try to throw something, try to make him throw something, then he didn't want to throw anything. I was kind of bummed that they didn't give you a post-fight interview. I thought you deserved that. Oh, it was, nah, I probably couldn't hear me anyway. I'm stay born and all that. It would just been a waste of time. Okay. But I mean, I just felt like you 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 deserved an opportunity to speak to people. No, you don't think it's probably for the best. What's that? I thought you 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 earned the right to speak to people. You know, like to tell your side of what was going on. Yeah, I guess so. You know, I was hurt, but still, that's no excuse because I just about all my fights, I come in the same way, in almost the same type of shape and pain, some some type of uncomfort, pain. So. You know, I should have still mustered it out and got the finish, or at least tried to. You didn't want to tell me on Saturday what 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 was said between you and Dana White. Could you tell <laughs> me now? I'm still not gonna tell you. Why? No, nah, that ain't I ain't no I ain't going behind his back and doing no, no female type stuff. You know, it's for females. Could you? If you told me that. That's it. Could you tell me if it's positive or negative? 
it was um I understood the conversation that what he had told me. Okay. And I understood it. Because he actually gave you props in the press conference. I don't know if you saw that. He didn't. He didn't rag on you. He didn't criticize you. Oh, that's good. Yeah. What are the chances yeah. now that you get back surgery? Finally. What's that? What are the chances you actually get back surgery? No, I'm not getting no back surgery, nothing like that. Uh, my manager was my manager was telling me that Cody Gombard, Brad, or whatever his name is, yeah, had went to um, Germany and got his back fixed, and said that uh, next week we're going to see if um, we could do something like that too. Oh wow, the Black Beast in Germany. That would be a great scene. Yeah, it'd be crazy. The probably need security out there. <laughs> Why are you so against back surgery? Do you feel like if you get it, you're done? No, I just heard bad stuff about it. So, you know, I don't want to sit out that long. Right. And so, what what is the game plan now? You wait for that, but but in America, you can't. Like, you need one of those radical Kobe Bryant type things. Yeah, I need something, man. But can you fight? It's, it's frustrating. I'm fighting with myself more than I'm fighting my opponent, really, in all of my fights. If if nothing changes, can you keep keep fighting under these circumstances? I would imagine not. It's too fighting, frustrating. I've been that's how I fight every fight since 2011. I've been having the same problem. How do you keep going? How do you do this mentally, let alone physically? My kids. Yeah. My kids are hungry, man. So you got to suck it up and hope that it doesn't flare up at the wrong time. Yeah, that's good. It's just a timing situation, you know. Some fights I could really muster it out. That's one of the reasons why I try to finish the guys so quick too. Are you going to try to lose weight also? Yeah, I have to lose weight. Okay. I lose 25 pounds. Right now, thank God, I'm at 275. Usually, I'm walking around at 290. But I got to um, at least this week or something start walking and something. Clean up my diet a little bit more. What's, what's the first thing that has to go from the diet? Uh, I don't know. It's a couple of things. Just, Proud donuts. Okay. That's a good one. Nah, it's not a good one. <laughs> well, I mean... It's... Love my Krispy Kreme. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and then before I let you go, honestly, as a fellow heavyweight, don't you think it was a little crazy that Brock Lesnar went in there and started... He didn't say your name, which I thought was interesting, as you noted on Saturday, but just ragging on everyone? The suspended fighter? Oh, it's... Anything to um, get get his name out there, I guess, get, get noticed or stuff like that. So I don't really care. You know, and, uh, I'm not trying to be the, the baddest man on the planet or the best fighter ever and all this. And, uh, a world champion. I'm not worried about all of that. Why do you think he to didn't see? it's a job. So yeah. I look at it like a job. So I don't, I don't care about that. I don't care about being the best striker, best wrestler, best whatever. No, I don't care about all that. Why do you think he didn't say your name, though? No, I don't know. Maybe he's been drinking. I, th I think he's scared. Oh, man, I get That man ain't scared of nobody. And I ain't nobody to be scared of. Nah. You need to tell Francis that. I, th I, think, I think you're giving yourself a hard time. I think you're down on yourself a little bit. You're still the black beast. Yeah, I'm okay. Yeah, I'm um, the black beast to my white neighbors. They scared him. That's about it. Uh, and, and, and did you get a chance to see Rondo? You guys were both in Vegas. She got the Hall of Fame. Did you get a chance to catch up? No, I'm not worrying about Rondo no more, man. Okay, you're done? Yeah, I'm done with that for right now. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'll let you go, Derek. Thank you for doing this. Keep us posted on, on Thank everything you, that man. happens. Thank you. Got, got these people waiting on me, man. Sorry, sorry, All sorry. Right. Sorry. Much love, Derek. Congrats. All right. Thank you. Thank All right. You. There he is, the Black Beast, Derek Lewis at Best Buy. We have done uh, interviews with him all over the place, never before at Best Buy. And uh, I personally think he's a little, again, as I said at the top, a little hard on himself. The back flares up. You ever have a bad back before? It's no fun. It's no fun. Let me see if I can find that. Oh, 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 oh. Ah. 
my thing is going all crazy here. I was trying to find that Francis Ngannou thing for the record. This is what he said. He said, I'm not proud of my last performance. I've carried my fear from the last flight to this one. I completely understand the frustration and anger that it has caused my fans, coaches, teammates, family, and friends, and I'm truly sorry for that. I won't let everyone down again. All I can do now is prove myself and make you proud again. Interestingly enough, one of the very first people to comment on the post was one John Jones himself who said, Brother, please don't feel like you let people down. No one understands what it's like to be in there. We're all extremely grateful for your performance. Thanks for being a great entertainer. Wishing you nothing but the best, but the best, my brother. Not the best. Nothing but the best, my brother. Uh, that's John Jones reacting to what Francis Ngannou wrote. Uh, Dana White, very critical of Francis Ngannou after the fight, uh, said at the post-fight press conference that he thought that uh, Ngannou's ego ran away with him, that a lot of people in the company were complaining about his ego. Uh, personally, never had that interaction, that kind of interaction with him. Uh, you know, seemed to be relatively the same from when he was coming up, was accessible and whatnot. Um, I think the biggest thing for Ngannou at this point is, okay, is he a part of Syndicate? Is he with John Wood? It, it still feels like he hasn't quite found a home. And look no further than Daniel Cormier to the impact of having a home, having people, um, you know, have your back, loyalty, like a system in place, a routine in place. It just feels like he's too all over the place. That's what I worry about with him. Has he, has he found, is Las Vegas best for Francis Ngannou? Has he found the right team? Has he found the right support system? John Wood Syndicate, one of the very best teams in the sport. Look what they did with Roxanne Modafferi. Look no further than that. Five fight losing streak and look what they've done with her. But it just seems like ever since he left France, he's turned into a different kind of fighter. You know, he did the, the, the Overeem fight. He was still with the old squad. And now it feels like things have changed. But the mental side of this game is very important. You can't just brush it aside. And my man Jake is telling me in a matter of moments, we are going to be joined by Michael Chiesa, who I do believe is at the airport on his way home from Las Vegas. Of course, he lost to Anthony Pettis on Saturday night in the featured lightweight fight on the pay-per-view card. And as I said at the top, Michael Chiesa weighed in on Saturday, excuse me, on Friday, before the Saturday fight, he weighed in a pound and a half over the 156 pound weight limit um, and said on the scale, this is my last time weighing in as a lightweight, that he was going to finally move up to 170. And I had heard some talk that, you know, this, this had been brewing, that he had been talking about the weight cut, you know, weighing on him, pardon the pun, for quite some time. Um, and then of course, afterwards on the post-fight show, I had mentioned uh, the injured foot, none of this coming from Kesa himself, uh, not not the kind of guy to, to throw out excuses just blindly like that, but curious to hear where he's at. I actually did see him briefly um, in the hotel after the fight and, and seemed to be in okay spirits, although somewhat down as well. I'm curious to see what he thinks about, you know, moving back up to 170 or no, moving to 170 and um, and, and how the foot, if you want to talk about it, affected his performance on Saturday night. Huge win for Anthony Pettis. Getting back on track, of course, the last time we saw Pettis in action was in November against Dustin Poirier. And obviously he lost that fight. The fight against Kiesa was supposed to take place in April. It was supposed to happen in Brooklyn. Uh, we all know about the Dolly situation. We all know about what happened um, with the fight getting canceled at the last minute, the cut, all that stuff and more. Um, but in the end, Pettis gets back on track and, and now we're wondering what's next for Michael Kiesa. He is kind enough to be joining us on the phone from, I do believe, the McCarran Airport in Las Vegas. Michael, are you there? Yes, sir, I'm here. Are you in the airport in Las Vegas? 
I am in the airport at Jamba Juice as we speak. Oh, okay. Well, I appreciate you squeezing us in, Michael. I really do. Um, first off, how are you feeling physically after the fight on Saturday? <sighs> you know, I'm just gutted, man. Um, you know, physically, I, I kind of feel crummy. Uh, as we all know, I had a I had a terrible weight cut, and uh, my body's just shot from it. Um, worst worst weight cut I've ever had in my career, obviously, and. Uh, you know, but physically, you know, the damage I took wasn't too bad. So, um, you know, it's, uh, it's just more than anything. I'm just disappointed in myself. Did you know that this was like you said, worst weight cut? Did you have a feeling, you know, when you got to Vegas um, earlier in the week that this was going to be tough? Like, did, did you see this coming? Um, well, I did my whole camp in Las Vegas. So okay. everything was on track. I started my camp uh, 10 pounds lighter than I normally do, given that, you know, the whole Brooklyn thing, and I had the fast turnaround, um, you know, because before the incident in Brooklyn, I was about 165, you know, one, I, yeah, I was about 165, so, you know, when I started camp for this fight, I was only 180, and, uh, or no, I was 190, started camp at 190, and sometimes I'm bigger than that, and uh, things were going really good, and, uh, you know, I, I had a foot injury about a week and a half before the fight, not this last Tuesday, but the Tuesday before one of my last sparring sessions, uh, I had a left kick get checked. I kicked I kicked my teammate right in the elbow and and uh I fractured my second metatarsal in my foot and I kept it hidden from the UFC and uh I just knew from then on like, you know, this is gonna be a hard weight cut. I didn't want to pull out of the fight. Um, you know, this is I didn't want to lose this opportunity to fight a guy like Anthony again. You know, it's a former world champion on a big card. I didn't want to lose that opportunity and uh, you know, I just thought I could tough it out and, you know, ultimately that was that was just kind of the beginning of my bad week for, for International Fight Week. How much pain were you in as far as the foot is concerned during the fight? How much did it affect your performance? Well, more than anything, it affected my weight cut. I'm okay. not, I'm, the foot is not a crutch as to my loss at all. You know what I mean? I, I know I heard uh, Duke Rufus in the corner calling for him to stomp my feet. They, obviously, they got to him that my foot was broken. I knew it would. You know what I mean? So that really caught, didn't catch me off guard. But more than anything, it was the hard weight cut. That was I, – I can't emphasize it enough, Ariel. I mean, I I seriously thought I was going to die. I, I literally going through the first part of my weight cut on Thursday, I I, I really thought I was going to kill myself. I'm not, wow. I'm, not, I'm not exaggerating in the slightest. And first and foremost, I want to give absolute mad credit to Lockhart and Lee. They are freaking awesome at what they do. They knew my situation with my foot. They did a damn good job getting me as close to weight as I possibly could. But ultimately, my body just had nothing to give. When you can't do road work for, you know, a week and a half, that really that's really hard on your weight cut. I came into fight week at 175 pounds. And usually I come into fight week at about 169, 168. You know what I mean? So they... They are awesome at what they do, but it was just too much for my body to handle. And you have never felt like that before? <laughs> no, never in my life. Usually taking it this, usually making weight for me takes just a couple hours. Usually it's about two hours. It sucks. I look like shit, but I get through it. You know, cut for a couple hours, make weight, go to bed, wake up, weigh in, I'm good. We cut weight for eight hours. I cut weight for four hours on Thursday night, and I was up at 5 a.m. cutting weight on, on the day of weigh-ins. And uh, my body just had nothing more to give. I'm, I'm, I'm not exaggerating. I, I, I thought I was going to die in the middle of the night before Friday weigh-ins. I, I woke up in the middle of the night. Somehow I fell asleep. I woke up. I started having a panic attack. I was, I was laying in bed with my girlfriend, and I was just, I started. I broke down. I started crying. I was like, I think I'm going to die. Like I really, I've never felt like this. You know what I mean? My body. I made 155 my whole career without a hitch. You know what I mean? And it never feels good. But it's never felt like this, never, wow. ever, in my, ever in my life. And 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 like like as far we've heard Uriah Uriah Hall say like he uh, thought he was suffering a heart attack, seizures. Like, could you tell us like what it actually feels like to feel that close to death, as you put it? Well, here's the thing: my vitals were good. Going you know going through the cut, they Lockhart and Leith are so good at what they do. They're checking your blood pressure, your pulse. You know they're making sure that as they're pushing me through the cut. They're not going to push my body to the point where something would happen. But after that first night, that's when I started to have some blood pressure issues. That's when we stopped cutting and sent me to bed. 
Like they were like, you, you've given all you could give tonight. We got to get after it tomorrow. And, um, you know, that's, I, I just, I, I really just felt like I was hyperventilating. I, I could feel my heartbeat just like it was heavy. It was hard. And I, I couldn't get my body to stop moving. Like, it's not like I was having a, I wasn't having a seizure or anything, but I felt like my body was like spasming. Like I was laying, they had to put pillows under my mattress to keep my feet elevated for, for blood pressure issues or whatever. Hmm. And I, I couldn't stop moving. I was like, I was trembling. I was, I was really afraid. I've never been, I, I, I thought I was like, I'm going to be the first casualty in wow. the UFC from a weight cut. I, I was really convinced of that. I've never felt like that. When you went on the scale on Friday, did you know you were over? That wasn't a surprise, right? We pretty much knew, yeah. And it was at that point, that morning, it took. So we went down at 930, I think, is when we went down and weighed in. And when it to get me to start sweating that morning took about a half an hour just to get me to start sweating. So I cut for four hours. We were very convinced I was on weight. I was in the tub for a long time. You know, I don't need to get into the details as to what, what I was going through that morning, but obviously involves a lot of heat, plastics, sweet sweat, the whole shebang. And, you know, we thought I'd be on weight, but once we got down there, it was like, I had nothing more to give to my lips were stuck to my face. You know, I, I was, I got carried down to downstairs to where the weigh-ins were, but, you know, obviously I had to stand on my own and go before the commission. I'm not going to get drug in there. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's just my body had nothing more to give. I could have went back upstairs and started trying to cut, but I, you know, I'm willing to bet dollars to donuts that uh, my body would have produced a lick of sweat, and I just would have damaged myself further. You know, and, and kudos to Anthony. You know what I mean? I know I'm sitting here saying I had this bad weight cut, and I think it really hampered my performance, but Anthony Pettis is a guy you have to show up at your best. You can't have injuries. You can't have a bad weight cut. You can't have anything going against you. You have to have a really good camp, and you have to show up really well prepared to compete against a guy like that. And, it, you know, ultimately it's my fault that I that I handicapped myself. I should have just pulled out of the fight. My best attribute, I feel my best attribute as a fighter has been toughness and been being able to overcome adversity. I've proven that throughout my career. And that attribute that I thrive on, actually worked against me this fight and I, I feel like it's a big part of the reason why I lost I should have made a business decision and just pulled out of the fight when my foot was broke when you were on the scale you said I'm done at 155 do you stand by that or are you still done at 155 <sighs> uh you know here's the thing it's it's like I'm, I'm a stubborn guy it's like I don't want to be done at 55. I don't want to end on that note. You know what I mean? I was already in talks with people around me like, hey, win or lose after this fight, I think I kind of want to go up. You know what I mean? I'm kind of – I'm at the UFC Performance Institute for all my camps from here on out, and I feel like I'm not utilizing the facility and my resources by having to focus on cutting weight. It's like I have these awesome, this awesome staff of, you know, strength conditioning coaches and nutritionists. Like, I'm in the right place to go up a weight class, to do it right scientifically. Like, I'm in a really good place to make that move. You know what I mean? But do I want to do it on this big of a loss, my second loss in a row in my career, off of a failed weight cut? I don't know. You know what I mean? I, a lot of people really are trying to steer me to 170. A lot of, even Lockhart and Leith, like, Leith told me right to my face, Daniel Leith has been, he's been the first guy I worked with through their company, and and he flat out told me, he's like, I hate doing this to you. He's like, I would love to see you go to 170. I hate putting you through this weight cut. I'm a big guy. People don't realize it. Like, they're like, you're going to go to 170 and you're going to get smushed. It's like, there's only one guy at 170 that's actually bigger than me, I think, and that's Darren Till. I'm not a small guy. I can, I can get up to 205 pounds and be athletic and be in shape. You know what I mean? I, I'm not small. So it, it's, it's, right now things are up in the air, but, um, testing the waters at a higher weight class and being able to compete without cutting weight for the first time in my career is something that, that, that sounds enticing right now. I don't want to go through that, what I went through that, that night before weigh-ins. I don't want to put my, girl, my girlfriend through that. I don't want to put my family through that. I don't want to put myself through that. Do you think that you need surgery on your foot? I don't think I'll need surgery, but I definitely, I'm going to, it's going to need some time to rest. I mean, I was just, I was in a boot and on crutches up until fight week started. And then I was just sleeping with lidocaine patches on my foot every night, rubbing lidocaine cream on it. 
aspirin, naproxen, sodiums, just anything I could do to just kind of like play it off. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but the, the foot didn't play any significance in the fight. You know, once adrenaline kicks in, you know, I was good to go. So that, that played no role in the fight. The better man won on, on Saturday night. That's for sure. And tough guy. And I, I give, I, I give him, you know, full credit, no excuses. You know, I, I screwed up. I screwed up and, uh, just, just try to be too much of a tough guy, I guess. Fair to say, if they ever open up a 165 pound division, that's the sweet spot for you. Yeah, that's that would be the absolute sweet spot for me. And I'm not going to take this time to get on your show and start bitching about adding new weight classes and stuff like that. If it happens, it happens. And if it does, I welcome it with open arms. I'm a big advocate for it. Um, you know, but you know, we'll just see what what happens. You know what I mean? Obviously, I'd like to go home, and it's been back to back camps. I've been gone for four months from my home. You know, I'd like to just go home and just kind of reset, reset the batteries, you know what I mean, recharge yeah. and, and figure out what my next move is. But if they, if they add a 165, it would be it would be heaven sent. You know what I mean? It would be it would be a blessing to a lot of us guys. I mean, I think the, the better half of the, of the people that are missing weight is at 155 pounds. And, uh, you know, you could really spread out a lot of the roster. A lot of the weight of the roster is at 155 pounds. So it's like you can spread that out, start a new division, have a new champion, a new person to market, more fights, more titles. It doesn't. I don't think it sounds like too bad of a situation. And and could you tell us before I let you go, Mike? Could you tell us what's the status of your your legal situation with Connor? Where do things go from here, as far as you're concerned? As far as I'm concerned, you know, yes, Ariel, you'll be uh, you know first person I've told there there is legal action. Um, and it's it's what's right. It's what's been advised to me by my team, and that's who I listen to. And um, you know, and as the, as things unfold, um, the truth will come to light as to why and, and things of that sort. But it's the right thing to do. A lot of people, I'm getting a lot of flack. Everyone calls me a snitch. Everyone calls me a rat. But no one's ever had you know the opportunity to compete just in general ripped out from under you by another person. Due to, due to an act of, you know, a vigilant act. So it's, uh, yes, there, I am going through legal action with Conor McGregor. Has that actually begun? Like, or have you actually sued him? Um, there's the wheels are in motion right now. Okay. Um, that's as far as I know. I, for me, I haven't been hands on with it. I've been very focused on my fight. Sure. Very focused on Anthony Pettis. Um, I love my manager, Daniel Rubenstein. To, uh, he's, he's, he's kind of spearheading the whole thing and just letting me do my job, letting me train. And that's been very stress-free for me. But for me, I'm just going by the advice of my team and my counsel and, and the people around me. And, and uh, you know, those are the people I listen to and trust, and they're the ones that are handling it. Okay. Uh, well, we wish you luck with that. Uh, sorry to hear, you know, that, that you went through such a hellacious time to try to get down to 155. Appreciate you coming on, Mike, and, and hopefully you get well soon. And, of course, I hope that your foot heals up soon as well. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. All right, we'll talk to you soon. There he is, Michael Chiesa. It's always tough when fighters come on uh, the show after a loss. Uh, he was very willing to do so, and I, and I certainly appreciate that. Wish him the best, and hopefully he recovers sooner rather than later. Okay, one of the big stories this past weekend, as I said at the top of the show, the coming out party of one Israel Adesanya defeating Brad Tavares, a very one-sided affair. I have a feeling he'll take umbrage with the term coming out party. Let's talk to the last style bender himself. There he is, joining us via the magic of Skype. Israel, how are you? You know me too well. I'm good. How are you? Uh, is it fair to say, Israel, you have been competing for a very long time in athletics, is this one of the more satisfying victories of your career just because so many people thought you weren't ready for this? Yeah, I mean, like I said, after like, a lot of the punters, a lot of the so-called experts in this game would, you know, they would say he beat me even like in a decision. I'm like, that means you think he's going to dominate me from bell to bell. So for me, I, 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 these guys just think I've only had two fights. They really go do their research they open their mouth next to me. And when you saw all that, I mean, clearly you look at it. Is it fair to say it gave you a little more motivation to, to perform better, to shut people up, to not just win, but do it, you know, in, in a world-class way, do it the way in which you did on on Friday? I was going to do that anyway, regardless, but I like a little, uh, I like a little saltiness in it because I'm bad like that. So, 
when someone um, says I can't do something or they they put you know what I mean like my boy danced it after his phone put some respect on my name yeah you know, people really and recognize did you honestly think that the fight would be that one sided um I honestly thought I was gonna finish in the second round like <sighs> I, I, I like putting guys away especially at this level I know I can. And I, uh, I linked the story back to my, my kickboxing career when I was uh, maybe like late 20s in my fights, like 20 something fights. And I only had like seven knockouts. And people were just like, oh my God, you've got no power, he's too skinny, and that. And then I just went on this tier of just knockout after knockout after knockout. And I racked up over kickboxing nine knockouts. So I feel like I'm still getting my feet wet in the UFC, you know, three fights in six months, I'm smoking these boots. And um, yeah, eventually you see me at the point where touch a book out of the way. Like, I'm in my watch. I'm in my watch. So um, yeah, I'm happy with the win. Of the three fights in the UFC, is this your favorite? Do you feel like you were at your best in this fight? And why then? So far. So, like what you said, it just feels good to shut people up, make them eat their own words, outside of, you know, whatever they like mac and cheese, grits. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't like to eat my words, so that's why like I say what I'm gonna do. I put it out there, so that way, like subconsciously, I have to make it happen. If not, I'm gonna look stupid if I don't make if I don't make you know like back up my. So it feels good to feed other people the as well that they were talking, and they can sit and accept it and humble themselves. I want to ask you for a mia culpa because I was one of those people who said. I didn't agree with the matchmaking, not because I didn't think, and I was very clear to say, not because I didn't think that you were ready to fight a Brad Tavares, because I wanted to see you get like 10 knockouts in a row, like 10 super duper highlight reel finishes. And I say, look, you called it, They called, this was the right call. I was just worried, like I, I, there's so much star power oozing out of you. I just didn't want to see you get slowed down, that's all. Do you see what I'm saying? It's different than, I didn't think that you weren't on his level, but I just wanted to see like this nice build where you get like a bunch of knockouts in a row. Do you get what I'm saying? They're coming. They're coming. I mean, those knockouts are going to come regardless, even at the top of the division. It's just right now I'm finding my feet. You know, I'm finding, I'm learning how to how to swim properly with these sharks, and and they'll be coming. I'll, I'll start, uh, even give me seven more seconds in that fight. Five more seconds. He wasn't going to get get out of my guillotine. I looked at it. I paused it. I look. My hand was under his chin. I was like, pass my hands together. Five more seconds was all I needed. You know, that mounted guillotine was sunk in. And, and by the way, Israel, are you? Um, is it possible that you're whole, you're you're like covering the speaker with your shit? My bad. Hold on, I'll do it this way. Is that better? Uh, maybe I'll ask you another question and then we'll find out because it like kind of goes in and out as far as like it's crystal clear when it's in. And and then it goes right. out for a second, um, kind of like your fighting style, in and out. How about that? That's a nice little. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now it's actually worse. I think you're covering it on the phone. Is there like a speaker on your phone that you're covering with your finger? Um, no, it's not. It's, it's open right now, but I'm not covering it. Give me a second. My brother just give me something to use. Maybe headphones. Wait. Give give me three seconds. No problem. Seconds. No Hold problem. On. No problem. No problem. Israel Asanya fixing. I just want to make sure that we hear him crystal clear here. I do believe he is still in Las Vegas or maybe in some kind of hotel room. Cause it's yeah, sure. brother, DBB. Oh, I, I met your brother. <laughs> you, did he tell you that I met him? Well, oh, yeah, he said he's a big fan. He's like, <laughs> yeah. He was yawning to you at the expo, was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah I saw. Wayans. Well, the Wayans. The Wayans, yeah. If I'm being that's honest. That's, that's yeah, this is better. This is better. Yo, yo. Yeah, this is much better. Uh, I'll try it again. No, no, it's good. You don't, don't hear me? This is the internet on network TV. will be fine. This is good. Did the headphones... Can you not hear me? All right, we're back on. We're live. We're live. You hear me? Are we rolling? Yeah, I okay. hear you. Okay. Good. Loud and clear. Okay. Cool. 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 Um. So. Okay. So you get the win, and right afterwards, you say, "I. I. I. I have my eyes on that middleweight fight tomorrow. The middleweight fight happens. It's Paulo Costa defeating Uriah Hall. You're still sticking to that. You want Paulo Costa next? Yeah. Um. I saw him backstage. He iced me. Uh, I told Dana afterwards I want him, but 
they're not really um, keen on that yet. But I want that fight. I just think I want to take him out. He's that guy that everyone thinks, you know, he's unbeatable. He's this and that, blah, 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 blah. But I like challenges. My last fight was a good challenge. I aced it. And I think this guy's going to be another easy challenge I can take over. He's he's, he's not as impressive as people, as people think because he's fighting guys that just stand there. They're like punching bags, and he just gets to work them. So, I mean, look at his arms. He's like a little T-Rex anyway. So how's he going to catch me if I'm in and out? <laughs> So what's the problem? Why isn't Dana in on it? style. Yeah. <laughs> Why doesn't he want it? Um, I think he wants it, but I don't know. Maybe his manager, the guy, like, you know, the gremlin, his manager is real weird and trying to act like they don't know me or something. They know who I am now. But um, Valid. Valid Ishmael. Yeah, him. Yeah. Valid. Talking like this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> crazy man. I like his expression. He's real passionate when he talks. Yes. He's like an old school pro wrestling manager. Yeah, pretty much. Like the, what do you call it? Undertaker's guy. Yeah, yeah, Paul Bearer. Oh, <laughs> 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 the guy with the urn. Yes. Um, so, yeah. so do you actually think the fight will happen? It will, but what I think with the UFC is they, you know, two undefeated guys coming up, young prospects. They see the potential matchup in the future. So they're trying to, I think, build us up to be super, super mega stars first. Uh-huh. And then get out. But I want that fight now, just so I, you know. Later on, I can say I smashed him, and I can we can do it again when when he's a superstar. If I beat him, it's not going to be the end. He's going to be around for a while. So I probably fight him two, three times in my career. Who knows? But um, yeah, we'll see. I can't say anything about Paulo Costa without fans replying. Oh, he's Vitor Belfort Jr. He's he's taking PEDs, things like that. Do you believe that? Sauce. Mm, let me think. Uh, after seeing Icarus, because at first, the whole PD thing, I was like, you know, whatever. People do steroids, cool. I'm not with it. But then I saw Icarus, and to quote Nate Diaz, everybody's on steroids. <laughs> everybody's on steroids. Holy shit. That really opened my eyes to the whole thing. And I've been talking to Jeff Nowitzki a little bit in and you know, I bit bits and pieces throughout this whole week. And uh, with Paula, I'm not sure. He looks the part, you know, but in Brazil it's easy it's easily accessible. I uh, I just think catching people like that, they're always ahead. It's gonna be a system of issue that can catch them. Like they're on the new they're on the new new that they can't be detected yet, maybe, but it doesn't matter. I've fought guys on steroids before. I've seen people with back knee after the fight, and I'm like, this the it was juicing. You know, but fuck, I'm going to punch him in the chin. I'm going to hit him in the body. I'll fight. I will I can fight him. I can fight him up. And if, if I fight him next, it will probably be three rounds. I'm sure it will be three rounds. But I don't care. I'll fuck these guys up either way. If so, so you tell Dana he's like, no, not yet. And I get that because you're two rising stars. Did he offer, oh, I think so-and-so makes more sense did you get any sense as to who they're thinking for you Nah, we talked about some other things we're um, oh we at we're intrigued it was a funny story i just happened to stumble into the room by accident i see mcmahon and we just started hanging out for like a little bit met dana talked a little bit and then after that i dipped well it was a good time yeah Not too much shop talk i don't like i don't like shop talk post fights i like to just chill on wine and turn off. but that was a little bit of schmoozing yeah uh, just networking with the boss <laughs> uh yeah but no shop talk okay keep it, keep it, keep so it what, what did you guys talk about mm, got into Derek lewis <laughs> he wasn't too happy about that uh, we talked about you know what's coming up for myself what the potential is and we talked about me about Anthony Kiedis' is a band name because, see, he looks like Dave Grohl a little bit uh-huh. and a certain face is iconic. And I met him and I was just like, I, you're from the Foo Fighters, I know you. And then my boy kind of nudged me and I was like, oh, no, 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 Red Hot Chili Peppers. But he didn't really mind. He, he was cool about it. And he said, he's a fan, blah, blah, blah. And we gone for a little bit. He's a cool guy. Yeah. And Dana told me he's like a mad MMA fan. Like, he's been talking about me before he met me. Oh, wow. So... Yeah, I mean, for me, it was cool. So now I got to, like, update my playlist, like, heavy. I 
with Disturbed, Metallica, ACDC. You know, people think I don't fuck with rock, but it's just I had a brain fart. That was all it was. It's all good. You were just in a fight. Yeah. You deserve a pass. What exactly. was it? What was it like, by the way? Vegas main event, big weekend, international fight week. Like to now go through the experience. Was it what you dreamed of? And more. And more. And then some. Wow. And a bag of chips. <laughs> uh, yeah. Before the before the fight, I was kind of like, I don't pay attention to all that shit because it's at the end of the day, it's bullshit. I'm in there to fight. I'm there to fuck someone up. So if I let the whole pizzazz and the pageantry of everything get to me, it could distract me from the task at hand. So I really wanted to focus on the task at hand and get that done first. Ooh, my bad. No problem. Back. Uh, yeah, I want to get that done first, and then afterwards, the basket, the ambience, and that's what I did. And what a weekend for your team. Dan Hooker with the win as well. Incredible knockout. You guys are on a roll. Shane Young as well. What's the secret over there? Eugene Behrman and the staff at City Kickboxing. Um, I keep selling people, man. Even I tell my team, like, right now we're in the midst of it. What, 20, 30 years from now, they're going to talk about us like we talk about the great ones. And, you know, New Zealand was on top at one point. And K1 was the pinnacle of combat sports. But it fell off a little bit. And now we, the whole squad, we're about to we're about to put it on again. We're we're, we're doing what they did back then. Yeah, and dance. It's amazing. Um, when do you want to return in a perfect world? I mean, you just fought three times in six months. You want to take a break now? You know it. Yeah. You, know, you can't just rev the engine all day and expect yourself to be sweet. So I just I want to keep training because I'm always training anyway. But I'm not going to do like the. The camp stuff, like the a the capacity, the VO2 max, pushing my my lungs all the time. I'll stay fit. I'll stay around, like, say, 40%, 50% shape. Like, I could take a fight instantly, by the way, just so you know. Short notice is nothing to me. I've been doing that for a long time. Um, but I'm just going to chill, not really worry about a fight on the horizon, um, and do life things. Yeah, you're going to just Idaho. Fight fight. You're going to Idaho, right? <laughs> Uh, no, I'm still in Vegas. Oh. <laughs> I'm out here. Yeah, huh. but we're off to L.A. today. We're going to go to L.A. And then uh, ooh, some things over there. And then uh, um, Idaho. I'll probably go on Thursday. Okay. Um, and last thing for you, Israel. Do you feel now, like, does this feel different, the post-fight glow? Does it feel like life has changed a little bit? Like now you're on the cusp of really doing something special? It feels, at least from my perspective, I'm wondering from your perspective. From my perspective, looking outward yes I can see the, the way people treat me is different the way certain people because it's Vegas people recognize me now yeah. right? I just thought you know, it's cool I'm getting stuck in the streets for photos and whatnot. but from my first person view I keep that same energy it's just me I'm just you know I never switch up I never change I just evolve um, and people can change around me if they can't handle what's happening if they don't know how to react to it the life that I'm living now, but I'm just enjoying myself. And I know it's going to be, when I go back to New Zealand, it's going to be the same thing as last time. But this time what I, I planned ahead, I knew after this fight, it's going to be quadruple stocks going to drop quadruple. So I just planned ahead and I adjusted for the attention I'm going to get. So I can't wait till I get home, debrief, hang out with my dog, Millie. And then, yeah, take all the good and bad and ugly that's coming through. Enjoy it, my man. What a performance. Great job. You killed it. You did a great job. And uh, what a joy it was to watch you on such a stage perform like that. It was really a lot of fun to watch. So congratulations. Enjoy the victory. They're going to keep doubting me. They're going to keep doubting me, Ariel. I will not doubt you. I promise. Ever. No, no, not you. I'm not talking about you. I I see you on the the wagon. Okay. I saved you a seat on the train. Thank you. You're good. (laughs) Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, I'm looking forward to what's next, but well done. Enjoy this one, and, and, and thank you to your brother as well for hooking you up with the uh, with the headphones, my man. Thank you so thank much. You. Respect. He says thank you and says respect. Oh, sure, <laughs> but... Uh, All right, we'll talk to you soon. There he is, the last style uh, bender himself. Uh, Israel Adesanya. Remember the name. I told you that after the first one, reminded you after the second. It was interesting. A lot of people wanted to jump off the bandwagon after the second, after the Marvin Vittori fight. Do not jump off the bandwagon. Trust me on this one. Israel Adesanya is a name to remember. What a win. What a performance against uh, one Brad Tavares.
and he confirmed it right there. It, it, it does, in fact, seem as though the UFC isn't all that interested in having him fight Paulo Costa next. I can understand the line of thinking behind that. Two super, 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 super studs. I mean, th this is... This, these two guys, like for very different reasons, these two guys are a promoter's dream, right? Adesanya, flashy, fun, talks a great game, typically a finisher, looks like a smaller version of John Jones, fights like a smaller version of John Jones. I mean, there's just so much to like there. And, and Costa is just like a freak of nature. He's got the look. He's got Brazil behind him. Um, he's got the power as well. Big win over Uriah Hall. Perhaps we don't rush into that. Perhaps that's a money fight that can be done in the future. I, I get that. I'm uh, I'm not going to I'm not going to nitpick the matchmaking for Israel Adesanya until, of course, they match him up against someone, and I don't uh, agree with it. But I, I do get where they're coming from on this one. Maybe it's a little too soon, because that could be a huge fight. So why why rush into it right now? I'm curious to hear what they want to do and. Paulo Costa's um, head wrestling coach, Eric Albaracin, and really the brains behind his whole operation, uh, told me that they want to fight Chris Weidman next, which to me is a smart call out. I don't think if I'm Weidman, I want that fight because where's the upside? <clears throat> to me, the fight that I'd <clears throat> like to see is Weidman versus Jacare. So there's a bit of a jockeying for position there as far as the uh, middleweight division is concerned. Uh, so we'll see how it all pans out. Now, one of the other big stories this past weekend the official UFC debut of Luis Pena, a.k.a. Violent Bob Ross. He picks up a very impressive first-round submission win over Richie Smullen at the tough finale on Friday night. We're now being joined by the one and only Luis Pena. Luis, how are you? Hey, I'm doing great, Ariel. How are you? I'm doing great. Where are you right now? Uh, I'm actually in Gilroy, California. Oh, okay. I thought you were in a hotel room or something. Uh, it looks like a... But you're not. You're I am. Oh, you are? No. Yeah. Why are you in a hotel room um, in Gilroy? Uh, is that is that your home base when you're training at AKA? Yeah, pretty much. Okay. Uh, how does it feel? You got your first UFC uh, win. Like, now that we're three days removed from it, has it sunk in? Do you feel like, okay, now I'm in the UFC, now this thing is actually happening? You know, for the most part, like, it, it's sunk in, but it still doesn't seem real. How do you explain that? Like, like... I've started like I've I've um, accepted, you know, that like I'm in the UFC and like I've got you know some more money in my pocket, but it's still like I'm still waiting to like wake up from the dream. <laughs> Does it feel a little more real three days later, or is this a, the same high that you were on Friday night? No, it, it's all like I finally like come down from all of that like. I, I I don't know. I didn't want to like stay in that mindset for too long because for me it's like the most important thing is like getting back to yeah. training and getting uh, getting better. When, when did you first start to dream about being in the UFC and actually like being a UFC fighter, winning in the UFC? When did that dream start for you? Um, man, it was probably have to be after my first amateur fight. Like I knew right after that, like this is what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. And now here you are. Now it's actually coming to fruition. It's unbelievable. Not only does it come to fruition, you pick up a huge win over a guy from a very famous camp. I know you wanted to be in the finals, and I know you were very disappointed about having to bow out. But this feels like a nice, you know, a, a nice consolation prize, right? Um, for the most part, you know, like I would definitely have to say um, the whole experience with Tough, the way it happened, like this couldn't have been a better end to that story for me. Okay. Um, was it hard to watch the finale? Um, a little bit, a little bit. You know, I was sitting there just knowing that that was my trophy to win. Yeah. Like, watching it the whole time. Overall, being on Tough, did you enjoy the experience? Like, being away from civilization six weeks, no contact with the outside world, having to cut weight, things like that. Like, did you enjoy actually doing it? Oh, no, without a doubt. I, I loved it. You know, um, it's one thing I've said multiple times, like during the small amount of time that I was there training and getting ready and fighting. Yeah. Um, 
I couldn't have asked for a better environment to thrive in uh, that sort of competition because I didn't realize like how much, you know, video games, TV, my cell phone, my girlfriends, all, all of that. Um, I didn't realize how big of a distraction that actually was and how leaving it was to get away from that and be able to focus on nothing but training. You, did you say my girlfriend plural or did you mean to say my girlfriend singular? Oh, I meant to say girlfriend singular, but it's kind of plural now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? Oh, uh, I've just had a ton of people hit me up, like, in my DMs and all that stuff. You know what I mean? Like, that that part has been the most hard thing to get used to. Like, I never want in my life feel uh, like I was in something like this to happen. Wow. Like, you, you have up you, you you now see what what happens when you become somewhat famous yeah like that's pretty cool like i don't know i don't know how to deal with that you know it's like i drop a picture on instagram and now it goes like a thousand likes in like an hour i'm like holy crap i i don't know how to deal with that you know what's amazing in there's this so many people go what? ahead sorry i was gonna say there's just like there's so many people watching now yeah well in 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 this um, environment where like a lot of the fighters look the same and wearing tough and things like that it feels like you're one of the the few guys on the show that actually broke through right you're because of your look because of your nickname it feels like you're one of those 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 faces that everyone recognized I saw people coming up to you do you feel like that helped you out a lot do you feel like uh, like just ha being a little different having the catchy nickname really helped separate you from the pack even though you didn't remain on the show for a very long time you know, I can't lie, I did. Um, people are going to recognize me. I'm a six foot three guy with uh, red hair and a dark complexion. You know, you just don't see that walking around. And then to be the kind of fighter I am, it, it makes me real memorable in people's minds. It makes me stick there. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll definitely say I definitely uh, think my look and the, the whole nickname helped me break through. But at the end of the day, that's not really what I was trying to do when uh, I just decided I was going to stop cutting my hair two years ago. Why did you stop cutting your hair? I literally just said, said to myself one day that I was going to stop cutting my hair. But I just felt like it. But like for any particular reason? As you, no, like I wasn't trying to do anything particular. Uh, that's just kind of how I live my life. Like if I feel something, I do it. Have you ever let your hair grow out that much? Not at all. Uh, the, the longest I've ever let it uh, grow out was probably the size it was right before my pro debut. And then I got it like uh, twisted then, but I don't plan on doing anything like that to my hair now. Wow. And you didn't have a beard either. I'm sorry. You didn't have a beard. You didn't have a beard either when, like, when you stopped cutting your hair. Did you have a beard? No, I actually like I could always grow out the beard, but at the time, I had a uh, like a handlebar mustache, like a Burt Reynolds. Oh wow, damn, that's pretty cool. <laughs> I yeah, I had a weird look going on back in the day. Uh, <laughs> it's amazing because like I look at your picture on Sherdog, and. It's like you're a completely different person. Like you, you have you just like you're just your whole vibe is different. You know what I mean? Like it's amazing what a longer beard and longer hair can do to someone. Yeah, I know, right? Like I feel like the in that picture I just look like a generic fighter, just a generic guy that comes out there and does it. But I feel like now when you look at me, you get a whole sense of like my actual personality, like the the person I actually am comes out a little bit more. And so the 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 hair grows, the beard grows. When does the nickname come? Uh, so like once once I started like growing out my hair and the my fro started like getting really big, people started making the uh, Bob Ross comparisons right away. But I never really like accepted the name Violent Bob Ross or like never did anything with it until like after my uh, fourth professional fight. Uh, it was for Flow Combat. And they tweeted out a picture of me, and one of the fans was like, when did Bob Ross's son start fighting? And then um, I forgot, like, I think Hunter Homestead, like, coined the term violent Bob Ross, and from there I just kind of let it grow. Did you know who Bob Ross was? Oh, yeah. Like, I had seen all his, like, they, 
right before that happened, they released all the joy of painting on uh, Netflix. So I watched all of it. Okay, so you were f- you were familiar with him, totally, without a doubt. Like I totally knew who Bob Ross was. I was like, yeah, man, I look, I like I used to say to myself while watching the show one time. I was like, wow. I kind of look like that guy. That's amazing. And, and and I feel like I should know this. I apologize. He is not alive, right? Or is he? No, alive? he's not. He's not alive. And you never met him before. No, I wish I had yeah, at this point. That would have been incredible. I know if we could get that side by side pick. Yes. Dang. Um, are you a good painter? No, I'm not. Oh. I just paint people's faces up in the octagon. That's a good. <laughs> that is a good reply, my man. That is a very good reply. Um, it's and could I ask, like, what is your, uh, like, what is your background? Because your look is so unique, as you mentioned, the red hair. Like, what, what it, your DNA is? What? All right. So I did the whole like ancestry DNA thing because I wanted to find out myself because I'd only been told that like I had a black dad and my mom was like hella mixed, <laughs> but uh, I found out um, I'm half African. And like thirty percent of that is made up of Cameroonian and twenty percent uh Benin Tongan. Wow. And then I'm part Mexican, Puerto Rican, Italian, German, Irish, and Apache Indian. Holy moly, that's incredible. So your mom is, is what? My mom's the one that's got the crazy mix. Okay. So you look more like her? Yeah, actually like if you seen uh, if you've seen a picture of my biological mom there's one of uh, me and her standing side by side. We look like a male and female version of each other. Wow. And wh- and your dad is what? Uh, I, my biological dad, I've always been told he was black. I never met him. Oh, you never met him. Okay. Um, and are you close with your mom? Yeah, we're kind of close. Like, uh, I actually was just talking to her the other day. That's like my biological mom. Like, I, I was adopted, so I've got like a bunch of different parents, actually. Oh, interesting. Okay. When were you adopted? How old? Um, I was I was adopted from birth. Oh, okay, but and so when did you meet your biological mom? When I was nineteen. How did that happen? Uh, really weird. Like one day, I'm literally just like getting ready to go to wrestling practice, and just like I like the same thing with my hair. Like it just popped into my mind. Like, hey, you should maybe look up your biological mom's name on Facebook because I'd never done that before. And so I just did it because, like, I at the time I'd never seen a picture of her. I didn't know what she looked like. All I had to go on was a name. So I typed her name into Facebook, and she popped up, and I was like, "Holy crap!" And then I remember, um, like, I messaged her right before I went to pre- went into practice, and I was like, "Yo, uh, I'm not trying to be your son or anything, but uh, am I?" <laughs> <laughs> and what'd she say? She was like, she just like typed back dot dot dot. Yeah, I think you are. And I what? was like, oh, man. Like, I, like, I'm like, i kind of like reliving the experience now. Because like, it was like, I have, I, I can't really describe how that feels, you know, to go from not knowing uh, where you come from and like who your, your parent, like who your real parents are, like where that came from to, uh, to like figuring all that out, like in the snap of a finger. Wow. It was ridiculous. And so you knew her name the whole time, but you just never actually like looked for her. And then you finally looked for her, and it was that easy. She responds to you pretty soon after, and yeah, says, yeah without a doubt. Like uh, I knew known her name, but like being so young and um, and being at the time, it was like Facebook had kind of just gotten to the point where it is today. When I uh, like finally did decide to search her name. Yeah. So it never occurred to me beforehand to like search for her on Facebook. Wow. And now do you have a relationship with her? Yeah. I uh I actually have a really good relationship with um her kids, my half brother and half sister. Okay. And and did you like harbor any resentment towards her when you met her at first? I mean, I think it's only natural like as a human yeah. to to harbor just a tiny bit of resentment. But, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a person that tries to grow in every aspect of my life. So, like, I've tried my hardest to, uh, to let, let all that go and let it be in the past. Okay, wow. And so how old are you now? Oh, I'm 25. I just turned 25 Thursday. Oh, wow, that's right. Happy birthday. I, I turned 36 on, Saturday, on Sunday, so we're, we're birds of a feather. Cancer, right? Yeah. 
Yes, sir. Yes. Happy birthday. Happy belated. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, same to you. So, no problem. So, 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 he, so you've known him for six years now. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. That's incredible. You wanted to come out with the flag, the, the We Are All One flag, right? And they said no. What happened? So, um, yeah, when I got there, they just asked me, like, what flag I was going to walk out with in, um, like, Italian or American. And I was like, I want to walk out with my own. It's got, like, all of them on, all the flags of the world on there. And they were like, cool, uh, we just have to see if we can get that approved from the, the higher-ups. And, like, about halfway through the week, they came and told me that they couldn't get it approved because they weren't able to, like, they didn't have enough time to be able to verify all the countries and get permission from all the countries to be able to fly their flags. Ah. And so that's that Jeez. was the problem. And, I mean, it is what it is, but the cool thing is, like, they're going through all those steps now so that I'll be able to, to uh, carry it out with me for my next fight. Wow, that's incredible. They're actually going through all the steps of getting all the flags cleared. Yeah, I think that's what they told me at least, so I'm, I'm hoping. Are you going to stick with AKA? Uh, yeah, most definitely. I I, uh, I love it out here. It's been a great experience for me, so I don't think I don't see myself going to any other big gyms or anything like that. Amazing. And and how soon do you want to return? Um, I'd like to see a return in like November, or December. Okay, you want to take some time off? I want now. to take. Yeah, I want to take some time to. Uh, come and get better you know what i mean like i feel like i'm uh you know i'm in the ufc and everything but i feel like i still have a lot to learn and a lot to a lot of areas to grow in so i still want to like i want to take the time after every fight to come back and like grow exponentially so that you never see the same luis uh in any fight yeah i like that i like that take some time hone your skills come back end of the year by the way uh, last thing how cool is it to see i i told you on friday Every time I talk to Daniel Cormier about you, he glows. To see him make history now that you're a member of the team, how cool is that? I like. I was speechless because you know it's something when you're you're with him all the time. Like yeah. you start to uh, it's, it starts to get normal. Like yeah. being around DC, you start to forget um, what he's doing the accomplishments he's made and like what he's about to go do. And it wasn't until like I saw the punch connect Stipe goes limp and like Daniel's standing over him with his hands raised, like that I remembered like this guy I've been working out with the the, the whole these these past two months is like literally one of the greatest of all time and just sealed his deal is probably the baddest man on the planet and one of the best fighters in history. Incredible. Amazing. Yeah. I, I mean, I can't, I know exactly what you mean. He's such a normal guy that you spend some time with him. You forget that he's this, this living legend and then you see him do the impossible and you're reminded. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Well, Luis, I wish you the best, my man. Congratulations. Great debut. Uh, whatever you're doing, keep doing it. And, and, and uh, I'm certain that you're only going to get better. So what a great start for you. Enjoy the victory. And I'm looking forward already to the next one. Thanks for coming on today. Thank you, sir, so much. I really appreciate you guys having me on, Ariel. It's, a, it's an honor to be on the show, for real. We'll have you on very soon again. Thanks so much. Enjoy it. Thank you, sir. Have a great day. All right, there he is, Luis Pena, a.k.a. Violent Bob Ross. Appreciate his time very much. And, uh, yeah, definitely, if you are not on the bandwagon, get on the bandwagon as well. I mean, we're talking to a lot of young studs here today. Uh, Israel Adesanya, Violent Bob Ross. This is one of the things that I that I always like to say about the UFC you know, you, you, we could talk about like, you know, lack of stars and how this thing is cyclical, but like guys like this come and just look, look, you see what I'm saying? He just got that vibe. He's just got that vibe. He's got that it factor. You know, he's got, he's got, he's got the fighting style. He's got the look. He's got incredible nickname, maybe the best nickname in the sport right now. I mean, that's just amazing. The guys at uh, flow combat, well done on coining that one. Well done. And, and props to him for, for shouting him out. Well done. Violent Bob Ross with a big win over Richie Smullen. So unfortunately for SPG, they did not pick up uh, the victory in that fight. However, uh, they did pick up the victory in the tough finale as uh, Brad Katona won the 145 featherweight contract. And we'll talk to Brad Katona of Winnipeg later on in the program.